Good morning, good morning. It is 2022 and we are in almost at the end of our first month. This month we've been doing a series called Order My Steps and we are at the last teaching of that series called Appropriating Hurt. Appropriating Hurt. The Lomaxes. They're a beautiful couple with a beautiful home and they're at that stage in life where all of their kids are grown up and they have this big home all to themselves. Some years ago, speaking of ordering our steps, God told them that people would come to stay with them and that they needed to help people kind of get to a better space in life, that God had situated them to be a blessing to other people. Editorial note, some of the hardest, hardest work in the world is helping people because most people that need help do not really want the help they need. You can be trying to help people and they're like, don't, don't help me. <laughs> you can get hurt helping people. So anyway, the Lomaxes felt this calling. They felt this calling to help people. And when the people arrived, they realized this was really more than a notion, this helping others, that this was going to be hard work, that this was going to take something out of them. And so the latest person, the latest person to come to their home was their niece, and their niece showed up with her two kids. And everything was going okay for about six months in, and then conflict arose. Lenny, Lenny, one of the owners, and his niece got into an argument. And he feels like she's just being disrespectful. You know, I, I gave her a place to stay. You know, I took her in without many questions. Her daughter's at the pool with no, super, no supervision, and now... She's getting mad at me. And Lenny feels himself getting angry. And the argument escalates. And you've probably been in an argument one or two yourself where things quickly get out of control. And Lenny feels himself getting hot. And then in the middle of their argument, the niece says, you don't listen, you just always trying to be right. Ooh. Lenny is mad and Lenny is offended. He just doesn't get it, like, that's not true. She's just talking out of anger. And so he goes to his wife, because you know, sometimes when people say stuff to us that hurts, we go to someone else for confirmation or we go to someone else to say, hey, that's not true, is it? So he goes to his wife and said, hey, look, you don't have to say anything at all. I know it's not true. But your niece said this about me. And his wife says, well, and you all know when anybody says well <laughs> to something you're asking them, it just doesn't get any better. Hurt is a part of the human experience, except often we really don't know what to do with hurt. You have a couple of options. You can never speak to the person again. You can never speak to the person again. You can never speak to the person again, right? Or you can be passive aggressive. I love that one. I have witnessed this one a lot. That's when people pretend that everything is okay, but there's a chilly feeling in the air, and when you least expect it, they get you back. And here's one that happens in the church. It probably happens other places a lot too, but it definitely happens in the church. Folks call someone else up other than the person that hurt them and complain. Or sometimes, like here, folks get into heated arguments that have led to even physical altercation. And yet others sit on it and they milk it until one day it explodes. This thing of being hurt is something we do not handle well, often making a small thing disastrous. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Anne reminded me a few weeks ago this notion that Jesus was partly divine and partly human, that we don't talk about enough. But here is Jesus in his hometown where people had seen him grow up as a child, but he isn't a child anymore. He's a man with passion and purpose who knows his why, but the community has a history with Jesus, and they remember when he was gone and the whole town was looking for him. They remember that child. They remember things perhaps he doesn't even remember himself about his story. They have a collective story of him. They can't shake loose. They know things about Jesus that none of the other regions knew. 
Some scholars think that the people actually, because they knew him, struggled with entitlement issues. So Jesus shows up to the synagogue and pulls out the Bible. No, not the Bible. He pulls out a scroll, unrolls it, and he begins to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captains and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus begins to share some profound words, and someone in the crowd is like, wait a minute, I recognize that guy. What? Is that that snotty-nosed kid, Joseph's son? And I wonder if in this moment, Jesus is hurt. He's got ego, and he's in the role, and here is someone remembering who he was. Someone caught in maybe a moment of awe that gets interpreted as a moment of disrespect. I ponder if Jesus is hurt. I mean, Jesus really hurt. And I want to sit with that for a moment because as humans, we are fragile and we rarely talk about it. Our feelings get hurt and we brush it off. There are lots of things that bother us and tax us. This injury is much more common than we realize and we rarely sit in the space and deal with the injury. Jesus had some options and instead of taking a moment, He does something that is almost the worst thing you can do when you're hurt, and that's Jesus hurt others. He uses his power and authority to reprimand this crowd of people that helped raise him. Thanks, Jesus. We appreciate that. And what comes next is not pretty. Jesus lets them have it, and he goes into religious history that maybe amounts to God's liberative work is for all and not just the chosen Israelites. And he's probably saying more that's lost on even scholars now. But one thing we do get, and they get it too, is that Jesus is laying them out. In my culture, we call it signifying. He is letting them have it. And we know they really get it because by the time he's done, they escort his behind out of the city. But it didn't have to be like this. Sometimes the best place we can be is right in the middle of the storm. So when I first got to Chicago, I wanted to find a church that I could join and grow with a faith community. So over a year, I went to different churches, and I finally found a church, and I met some new people. And so one of them was Karen. And so at this time, I didn't have a car, and so Karen was the designated driver. And so on this particular day, we were going somewhere, but Karen decided we wouldn't take the road most traveled. She knew a shortcut. She sped down side roads I had never seen, pulling up to stop signs, putting on the brakes, flying off, flying over speed bumps, flying around curves. And then I decided it was time to put on my seatbelt. You know that moment when you discover you are in a car with someone who increases your fear and you just want to live, and so you decide to put on your seatbelt. And so when we got to where we were going, I turned to Karen and I said, geez, Was it worth the two minutes we saved? And we laughed. Sometimes in life, we take all kinds of road to avoid the storm, to avoid our feelings, to step away from the hurt and pain. And I got to ask, was it worth it? And it really doesn't save us any time, and it doesn't make things better. And sometimes we make the situation worse, like Jesus. The text says he went on his way, but but, but did he go on his way? and not without harm. There certainly wasn't any healing going on that day. There weren't any miracles performed on that day. I'm not trying to do this on purpose, but I have been watching shows where there are drug dealers as the main character. I don't know what's going on, but I'm watching one now because human beings are more than just one thing. We're complicated. We're nuanced individuals. And when someone tells you, I don't know, a lot of times they really don't know because we're that complicated. So on this show, the guy is wounded and he's bleeding and he doesn't want to go to the hospital because I guess drug dealers don't want to go to the hospital. And you can see this blood coming out of his arm and his homies are like, man, you need to go to the hospital. Some of us are bleeding and we need some help. And if we aren't bleeding, we are wounded, and we keep living out of our woundedness. And we have been living out of our woundedness for so many years. Our spiritual formation is charred by our hurt. So Lenny is bubbling. Lenny is upset, but he trusts his wife, and he knows she's got his back, so he goes to God in prayer. It's me, Lord, and I need a word from you right now. And then God gives him the memory of when he was in special ed. 
when the school put him in special ed and the teacher said to him, don't try so hard, you're not going to be anything in life. Or at least that's how he heard it on that day. And ever since, Lenny's been trying to prove that teacher wrong. He's been trying to be right. Lindy is wounded and he looks good and he talks good and he sounds good and he's thriving in his career, but he's still wounded long after the bleeding has stopped. You see, when we are hurt, we do a couple of things. We end relationship, we cut folks off, we ignore folks, we engage folks less. We come to an agreement which really isn't an agreement. We do all sorts of funny things. Can I tell you as a pastor and as a therapist, I am credentialed enough to say that 95% of the time folks try to put distance between them and hurt. Look at Lenny, look at Jesus, look at us. Look at you, two things that send folks out of the room and one of them we're gonna deal with in the annual meeting today, finances. <laughs> and the second, conflict, hurt. People will come to me and talk for hours. They'll talk for hours about something that hurts them. And then when I even hint about talking to the other person to look a little deeper, they'll say, no, it's like pulling teeth. They'll say something like, it wasn't that serious. And I'm like, well, if it wasn't that serious, why did we spend the last hour talking about it? They will lie to themselves and everyone else, but we know. We know it matters. People come up with all kinds of excuses to run away from hurt. When you are hurting, there are only two places to go, and often we go a lot of other places we shouldn't go. To Jesus in prayer or to the person in the situation Oh, and one more, a trusted, wise, spiritual person who loves you and God. And that ain't everybody. I can count those people on my hand. <laughs> Lord, order my steps right now because I'm about to do something crazy. Having our steps ordered by God is a disposition. It's being open to God. Often we live this life on our own terms and don't lie to yourself. We do. But what does it mean to sing hymns about come to Jesus, about I surrender all, about trusting the Lord, about leaning on the everlasting arms if we don't do it? What does it mean to live a life under the influence of the Holy Spirit? Lord, order my steps. Life ain't all that bad, but how much more effective would we be if we allow God to be present in our lives, in our journey, in this thing we call life? Even when we walk on, on pain, that God would be there, God ever present in the eye of the storm. God speaks to us in so many ways, and don't get spooked because some of people hear audible voice, but many of us, God speaks to us in different ways. But first, our disposition has to be one of being open and willing to be guided by God, willing to have our steps ordered by God. So this year I was in the mall. I was feeling a little sad and doing something I rarely do, indulging in retail therapy. I was in a store specifically looking for a certain item and I was walking through the mall feeling a weight on my shoulder and I passed a bookstore. So this is an editorial note. I need another book like I need a hole in my head. <laughs> I got way too many books. I'm like if I never ever bought another book, I could be reading books for the rest of my life that are in my home, that are brand new, that have never been open. And yet on this particular day, I stepped into the bookstore because the bookstore feels a little like heaven to me. Maybe some of you can relate, like when you walk in the bookstore and there's all these beautiful books and the smell and titles that invite you and you let your hand kind of glide over one of them. And you pick the book up and you feel like there's something in there that's just for you, that's going to take you on a journey, that's going to take you on a road trip. And so I continued to venture into this store. And I got further and further into the store. And then I saw a sign up hanging high, a sign with a word I like. And that word was bargain. Like if I'm going to do damage, let me at least bargain the damage. <laughs> So I stepped into the bargain section and I went to an area I never go to. I mean, I never go to because I'm not interested. Why am I here? And I reached for a book that wasn't very visible. And I opened it up and God spoke and I continued to read and I felt the presence of God so heavily. 
And I went to the counter and guess what I learned out? This book was not on sale and it wasn't part of the bargain and it was like, oh, so you tricked me. This shelf was bargain and this shelf wasn't. But I thought the book was worth it and I knew without any doubt that God had ordered my steps. God speaks to us in the ways that we understand. God might speak through me in a book. Now, if you're sitting there and you're saying, I don't even like to read books, then God's probably not going to come to you in a book. I wanted to cry because I felt the presence of God, and it felt so beautiful and powerful, and a cloud lifted off of me that had been on me for some time. When we open ourselves up to God, God will find all kinds of ways to get the message to communicate with us ways to get our attention, ways to guide us. And all we have to do is be open, open to the whim, the way and the will of God. We find God calls us back right to the eye of the storm. I saw this post in an anti-bucket list. What's one thing you will never do again? Think about that. What's one thing you will never do again? Interesting responses. One guy said, I will never date. I'm like, that's someone who's hurt, needs some healing there. Another person put bungee jumping. When I was a kid, my mom took me. I will never go bungee jumping again. A third person said, I will never get on a roller coaster. And I thought, well, that's sad because life is a roller coaster ride. Life is full of twists and life is full of turns and ups and downs, and it happens quickly. Life is also full of surprises and joy, and it takes your breath away sometimes. Life dips, but we find ourselves up again. Life is an adventure for which we want to be fully present, not milking old wounds. And we are invited to bring our faith, and yet we can ask the Lord to order our steps. We can ask God to be with us on this ride. We can ask God to help us. We can ask God to be our bridge in this life over troubled waters. Like a bridge, Lord, over troubled waters, now and forevermore. <coughs> and so while we often look to Jesus as an example of what to do, today in the text, Jesus is a perfect example of what not to do. Amen. <laughs>